Good morning, everyone. Jim Laird here with Dr. Stillman. Um, thanks for tuning in. If you're watching, please hit the subscribe button, hit the little bell notification so you know when we go live. Also, Dr. Stillman is doing an HTMA hair tissue analysis course. He's doing a webinar on that course at the end of the month. Make sure you click in his link tree and go to the HTMA secrets uh, link and register for that. And so you can uh, tune in and learn all about uh, H2MA hair tissue analysis and what that means and how to how to basically interpret those labs and what you need to do about it. Dr. Stillman, um, first of all, how are you today? I'm doing well. How are you, Jim? Good. I think most people understand how important magnesium is, but mm -hmm. I mean, we generally see tons of magnesium deficiencies and obviously we've got lots of chronic stress. We've got really crappy, you know, magnesium levels in the food and the water. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and all these different stresses that we're under, mm -hmm. how, how vital is magnesium and, and how, how many people do you think really are not getting enough? So one of the most important things for people to understand about magnesium and its balance in our diet and in our modern world is that uh, historically um, soils and diets people have consumed, particularly in traditional cultures, have been very high in magnesium. Uh, the principal sources of magnesium in our diets are green leafy vegetables, uh, certain grains like oats, um, some surprise foods like, say, molasses, uh, various other plant foods like beans, legumes, like I said, whole grains and pseudo grains, and then protein sources. So protein sources are actually loaded with magnesium. As we've bred our food more and more and more, both animals and plants, they've been bred to be bigger and the plants in particular have been um, fertilized with what we call NPK fertilizer, which is nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. And so that's putting nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus back into the soil. And that's the rate limiting uh, combination uh, for the plants to actually grow bigger and taller and fatter. Okay. And I'm explaining all this because it's really important for people to understand that over time, our soils have become depleted in magnesium. That means our food is depleted in magnesium. And so we're getting less magnesium from our food, even if you're eating a healthy diet than we ever have before. Now add to that the fact that chronic stress and acute stress will deplete magnesium from the body. And you have a perfect storm for very low levels of magnesium across the population. You really have to work hard to maintain a normal or optimal magnesium level I actually just had my mag levels checked uh, this past week. My magnesium level was about 2.3. I forget the units. But for those of you who don't know, the normal reference range is 1.6 to 2.3. Now, you might hear that and think, oh, so Dr. Stillman's at the higher end of normal. But what I want you to know is that doctors are trained to check magnesium levels in people who have a lot of cardiac disease and in people who particularly are in an acute uh, cardiac, uh, having an acute cardiac issue, like heart attack or rapid heartbeat or something like that. People hospitalized in the cardiac ICU. So when we look at the normal range for magnesium, it's really been adjusted down and serum magnesium levels are actually one of the strongest predictors of your overall risk of death and disability, which means that keeping them at the upper level of the range is really wise. I am not familiar with any literature showing that pushing a magnesium level in the serum or the red blood cell, which is the two main places people measure it, higher and higher and higher, results in any kind of complication or problem uh, for patients. And that's really important for people to understand because it shapes how I think about magnesium replacement and repletion. So when I'm looking at a case, I'm saying, okay, what can we do to optimize this person's health? And this is why in the annual plans, we have quarterly lab draws that are scheduled and planned out because we want to see what the trajectory of your labs are. Is your magnesium going up? Is it coming down? Is your vitamin D going up? Is it going down? You know, for example, my magnesium, sorry, my vitamin D level came back the other day and it was only 46. Now it's 46, despite the fact that I'll do up to 10 minutes in front of the spurty vitamin D lamp some days, particularly when I'm not getting intense UV light. I live in Florida. I don't use sunscreen. I spend a lot of time outside on the pool deck, in the pool, at the beach, in UV indexes of six, seven, as high as 10 or 11, getting my vitamin D way up. And side note, uh, magnesium is necessary for all the, all the metabolic reactions to make magne or sorry, vitamin D and in order to turn it into its active form. So a low magnesium level can translate into a low vitamin D level. Very important to understand. 
back to the magnesium uh, uh, reference ranges, I actually want patients to be at the high end of the normal, or I want them to be above it. So I just got a patient's labs back. She supplements very aggressively with magnesium and has been for years. She gets IV magnesium from a local practitioner in her area. And she ends up with a magnesium level that's like 2.4, 2.5. I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's higher than the reference range. But she feels better on more magnesium than not. And so I'm trying to push people to a higher level than the vast majority of people are. And the vast majority of practitioners know when you look at how low some people are, it's really playing a critical role in why they have a lot of the illnesses that they have. Practically every disease under the sun is linked to magnesium deficiency in our modern world. And that just brings me back to stress, which is that lack of sleep, artificial light at night, um, uh, even things like sound pollution or EMF have been shown to create stress in our bodies. And that stress has been shown to then deplete magnesium. So the more stress you're under, the more magnesium you're going to need. And the, and you know, if you're, e if you're eating food that you get in the grocery store and that's not grown by a local farmer in an organic sustainable, let's say permaculture type of way, you're not going to be getting a normal level of magnesium from your food either. Would you say that for most of the lab work, if not all of it, is kind of the normal ranges are kind of skewed because it's based on a sick population? 100%. It's a big problem that's giving people the illusion uh, of, of health. And that's one of the reasons why I actually like hair tissue mineral analysis, because the hair tissue mineral analysis that I use comes from a lab that laid down what the normal levels were in a healthy population of athletes in the in Arizona back in the 1980s. So before the inundation of LED and artificial light, before the inundation of our world with cellular phone, cell phones, Wi-Fi, wireless technology. I mean, the 1980s, I'm not even sure if we had cordless phones at that point. We, we yeah, had, that was when they were first rolled. I remember my dad got a Motorola uh, that plugged into the cigarette lighter. And it was right. like the size of a briefcase. And it was like, I can't remember how much it cost per minute, but it was something ridiculous. He got it for, for work, I think, and some and for emergencies. But even uh, wireless phones that were like, you know, we have a base station in your house and you pick it up and you can walk around the house with it. Yeah, that was that was just starting to roll. Everyone thought those were so cool, you know. Right. So, so almost no, you know, radio and microwave radiation compared to now very little blue light at night. I mean, the television would have been the biggest exposure or some high, you know, color temperature, uh, incandescent bulbs. Um, you know, we, we weren't being inundated by social media, which I think creates a lot more stress than people are aware of. Yes. I mean, you know, people were spending more time outside. They had more local community and it's very rare for me to see a hair tissue mineral analysis today that looks anywhere close to these normal healthy reference ranges. And I like hair tissue mineral analysis because it gives me this baseline of what was the healthy populace. If you want to find out what a healthy, normal magnesium level is, you really have to go back to the literature and ask, okay, who actually measured this in a large population of people living a traditional ancestral diet? With MAG, I can't think of a single, I can't think of anyone who's really studied that in a specific population, although I'm sure it's been done. The classic examples of this would be things like triglycerides and lipid panels. So we look at the, uh, the Greenland Eskimo and Inuit. They are actually, it's only, I think it's the Greenland Inuit. I can't remember if it's Eskimo or Inuit who live in Greenland. But anyway, uh, they did these studies back in the 40s before those populations really modernized. And they looked at their lipid panels. And that's a big part of where we get our ideas about what optimal omega-3 or omega-6 uh, ratios are. There's other literature that's, that's involved in that. And obviously that's a really unique population because of their light environment. It's very unusual. And the cold. Right. And the cold. Um, but it's, it's one of the things that I look for is do we have a reference range that's not in a sick, uh, overly stressed, chronically stressed population? So what are some strategies that people can, can do to get more magnesium in their life? Like the foods they can eat. Um, what are the different types of uh, tools you like to use to help get people to get more magnesium in their life? Because I think you know it's safe to say that everybody needs to get a little more magnesium in their life. Yeah, you know, absolutely. If you have specific issues, then you know getting some lab tests and stuff would be be wise. But uh, 
And, and what, what uh, kind of give a brief overview. I know, you know, it can be related to headaches. Obviously you said the inability to, you know, produce vitamin D and obviously if you don't produce vitamin D, you don't produce testosterone, all this stuff kind of, you know, is all linked together, but generally like what kind of things do you see with somebody who has uh, a lot of mag like magnesium deficiency itself? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and boy, it's a lot of questions. So I am going to show people uh, some of the strategies and tactics that I use and that I actually share with patients here in a second. Um, the last part of your question was, um, why do, or what, what kinds of symptoms do we see with low magnesium levels? The first one that I think about is a loss of energy, um, because it's a really, it's a really important mineral for your overall, uh, energy production in the cell and your cellular bioenergetics. So when people don't get enough magnesium, they really end up overwhelmingly feeling tired and sluggish. I look at, at symptoms like brain fog as just being fatigue of the brain. So anyone who comes to me saying I have brain fog, I'm thinking they may have a magnesium problem. One of the mistakes I see people making is thinking I have this, that, and the other symptom. And let me run through the, the key symptoms that I look for in, in magnesium deficiency and severe magnesium deficiency. They are, as I mentioned, brain fog, fatigue, anxiety, um, particularly if they have panic attacks, it's almost always a mag deficiency in the picture. And even if they're not overtly deficient on lab testing, they almost always get better or feel better with supplementation. Uh, ADHD, very, very common. Um, uh, headaches, I think I mentioned that. And any kind of pain syndrome, because that pain is a stress, creates stress, depletes magnesium. Um, you'll see it keeping company with any kind of GI illness in part because magnesium absorption becomes impaired. Frequently, those people have problems with stomach acid or enzyme production. They do better with bitters, enzymes, HCL. That improves magnesium absorption. Anyone who's been on a PPI, H2 blocker, or any kind of antacid, the antacids will neutralize your stomach acid, which you need in order to absorb the magnesium. Uh, and then any kind of neurological disorder. You know, I mentioned brain fog. I mentioned headaches. I mentioned fatigue. But the reality is that a lot of neurological disorders, uh, whether you're talking about dementia or some kind of movement disorder, um, like children with autism, they've been linked in many cases to low magnesium levels for a long list of reasons. So I'm not saying anyone with any of those problems needs magnesium. I really think it's better to get some lab testing done uh, to figure out where you are. Because the other thing, and this is what I was alluding to earlier, is that people will make the mistake of thinking that their problem is primarily a magnesium problem but they'll often miss a vitamin or mineral deficiency along the way that's actually more important for their health and well-being. And I shouldn't say more important, but it's it's creating, it's like 70% of the problem and the magnesium deficiency is like 15% of the problem. And then there's a 15% outside of that that's something you know else, so. Gotcha. Yeah. Did you find what you're looking for? Uh, yeah, I'm just going to show people this. I'm, I'm, I'm populating it out right now. And for people who don't know, I love teaching people about how to get better with food. Uh, and so I actually do a lot of, of coaching about what to eat. So, Doc, why. would you say the chances of having some of those wicked imbalances, like where you're missing other vitamins, are a lot less when you try and get your magnesium up by a food than just taking a supplement? 100%. Yeah, I absolutely believe that. Yeah, because I mean, usually food and nature comes in packages, right? It usually comes right. with the other things that are that are necessary, and that's why you got to be really careful with with supplements because you can take something, and it can be very effective if it's done properly. But you could take something that doesn't come in the complete package that it needs to come in um, to work properly, right? Right, exactly. You so might gonna, create a bigger imbalance. Yeah, exactly. So um, I'm going to walk people through. Uh, let me get in this. Okay. And you're pulling out fancy dancy karamber. Is that I am. Mean? And if you're listening to this, there's going to be some information on the screen. I'm going to try and narrate it as best I can. But if you really want to look at this, if you're a visual learner, it's going to be on the video on YouTube or Facebook or we're on LinkedIn and Twitter now too, which is amazing. Yeah. Okay. So you should be able to see my screen. Uh, this is chronometer. It's an app I use to help people track their diet. Very, very helpful for informing people of what they're eating and how it's actually impacting their overall health and well-being. 
smoothies in the morning are one of the ways I help people get a lot of magnesium into their diet. I don't make for the record a smoothie that's just oats, chia seeds, and molasses. This also works as like a breakfast porridge if you want it. Uh, this is, you know, a whopping like 500, almost 600 calories right here. And it's as simple as one ounce or 28 grams of chia seeds, 100 grams of dry quick or regular oats, and then one tablespoon of molasses. I'll often use this as something like a base of a smoothie and then add some protein powder. So I'm not just getting a, a huge load of carbs. But one of the things you'll see in the magnesium content of this, of this, uh, just this three combo for a smoothie, which is just the beginning of a smoothie in some cases, you're already getting 350 milligrams of magnesium. I do want to caveat this by saying, you know, I alluded to earlier that we don't really know what's happened to the magnesium in our food because it's been overbred and the soils have been over fertilized. So our levels from food may be much lower than this, which is why I buy organic and bother to find good sources. Um, but I mean, you know, I at least hope that they're not that far off from these numbers. And even if they are, that only makes it more important to be careful with your sourcing. So like I said, you know, 100 uh, grams of oats, which is three ounces uh, one ounce of chia seeds and just one tablespoon of molasses, you're, you're looking at 350 milligrams of mag just before you're even, you know, done with breakfast. So lunch, uh, six ounces of a sirloin steak, one cup of brown rice, which is, I know is a lot for people, some people anyway, but it's not that much if you're, if you're lifting weights, particularly, and if you're young and healthy, two cups of raw baby spinach, you could do that raw. You could do it steamed. This comes in at 150 milligrams of magnesium. And a lot of people are, you know, I think a lot of people think, oh, greens are where I get the majority of my magnesium. You actually have to eat an absolutely stupefying amount of greens to get a ton of magnesium from greens, right? So if you look at these two, two meals, the lunch with the steak, brown rice, and spinach, you're getting um, 534 calories versus that breakfast, 575. There's half as much magnesium in this lunch as there is in the breakfast. It's still a nice load. And the other thing about this meal is that it contains the protein, some of the fats, and some of the micronutrients that people often I see running low in, like, for example, uh, folate. There's a lot of folate in spinach. And then the last meal of the day, which is bigger, it's an 860, 70 calorie meal, way more than a lot of people are used to. Sockeye salmon, bone broth, quinoa, pine nuts, Swiss chard, and it's two cups of Swiss chard six ounces of sockeye salmon, one cup of cooked quinoa. And then I picked 28 grams of uh, pine nuts. I love putting pine nuts on my food and then one cup of bone broth. So how does this stack up? It's another 300 milligrams of magnesium. And that's again, a lot for a single meal. Uh, the other reason why I like um, these combinations of food that I'm sharing with you today is that this ends up being, and I'm going to zoom out and show people what the whole diet looks like. So this is about a 2000 calorie day. You're getting 160 grams of protein, which is excellent. That's going to help people gain muscle, uh, burn fat. A lot of people need this kind of protein load and they don't tend to get it eating what they're eating because they're not actually getting adequate serving sizes of protein. When you look down at the amount of magnesium that's in this day, it's 800 milligrams, which is almost twice what people are recommended to get. And I will tell you, having taken many, many, many dietary histories from people, that there's lots of people getting less than 300 milligrams a day of magnesium, and it creates a lot of problems for them. Okay. Uh, one of the things I want to point out here, I'm just going to add another food to show people uh, just how different things can be. Uh, so if we look at something like, if we compare, say, uh, pumpkin seeds, chia seeds, and pine nuts, all three of these on this day, I, I included as one ounce serving. So it's the same amount of weight, but look at the differences in their magnesium load. So there's 160 milligrams of, of, of magnesium in pumpkin seeds. There's 100 milligrams of magnesium in the same amount of chia seeds. And there's 65 milligrams of magnesium in the same amount of pine nut seeds. Okay. Why is that so important? Jim likes to say small hinges swing big doors. And he's gotten me totally crazy about this saying because it's just so true. If you're eating pumpkin seeds every single day, as opposed to another type of nut or seed like pine nuts or hazelnuts or pecans that don't tend to be as high in magnesium, it's actually going to have a huge effect long-term on your overall magnesium status. And this is why so many people, 
and this this comes out in many different ways. You know, I'm actually wondering right now as I look at this, you know, what's the difference in the magnesium levels between two different types of greens? Um, and I see on here, yeah, there's not that big of a difference between the chard and the, and the baby spinach. But my point is simply this. You're going to see huge differences in nutrient loads between different foods, and that's why details matter. It's why I do group coaching with people where we walk through exactly what they're eating, how much. And if you're intimidated by that or it – I mean, I've had p people tell me, look, I can't do that. It, it, it g basically gives me PTSD to when I had an eating disorder. I un completely understand that. It's not essential. But knowing what foods to pick and choose and then helping you understand, okay, here's what my serving size should be based on things like, is it the size of your fist? You know, is it the size of a grapefruit or a large grapefruit? Is it the size of a, you know, bowling ball? I haven't ever told anyone to eat that much of any one food. I think you're looking for handful. I think that's the word you're looking for. Well, I think it's interesting, you know, like half a palm, palm, uh, mm -hmm. fist. These are different ideas or different notions of how much food. And the beautiful thing about them is they scale to how, big you are yeah. right yeah. Uh, so you're actually getting something that's proportional to your your body size so and it's, it's super efficient as well wouldn't you say like nuts and seeds like obviously in moderation you don't want to be like the cashew monster i don't know anybody like that um who you know eats a massive amount of nuts and seeds but wouldn't you say nuts and seeds like a little bit every day of different types of nuts and seeds is one of the best ways to like balance out your minerals and your nutrients because Without a doubt. And that's one of the things that's worth, you know, noting in, you know, that, that, uh, that sample day of, of data that I just pointed out, right? So if you look at the magnesium in this day, one ounce of pumpkin seeds is three times as much magnesium as two cups of raw Swiss chard. Put that in perspective. Think about how long it takes for you, would take for you to, to eat two cups of raw Swiss chard. Ugh. It would be a small, you know, like it would be a, a, a 20 minute, you know, task to chew that much Swiss chard, even with perfect teeth. Okay. And pumpkin seeds, one ounce, that's a handful. You can take care of that in five minutes or less if you really don't chew them well, which I don't advise. And so the point is simply this, you're going to be surprised by where your nutrient loads are coming from in your diet. And you're going to hear things like greens are rich in this or nuts and seeds are rich in that. And that's all kind of true, but not necessarily. And we see some pretty amazing things happen when we really help people eat a more nutrient and mineral dense diet, which is what you're looking at right here. I mean, if you look at all these mineral scores and for people listening, you know, you may not be able to see this, but you know, I'll, I'll give you the short version all the mineral scores on this day, except for sodium and calcium, are through the roof compared to what people are supposed to eat, according to the obedient idiots who run the USDA and set what these numbers are supposed to be. Okay. So we see people doing marvelously well when we put them on a nutrient and mineral dense diet like this. And again, we tailor it to people uh, because you're all going to have unique allergies or food intolerances. You're all going to have unique um, medical problems or laboratory values. We may need to push potassium in some people versus magnesium in others. Some people may need to have more manganese or copper or zinc. And we can do most of what we want to do about our nutritional status through food, which a lot of people are missing out there in the, in the conventional uh, narrative. So James asks, doctor, if I increase my magnesium intake, do I also need to increase calcium intake? And the answer really depends, James. But the bottom line with magnesium uh, magnesium intake is that you generally want to push it very high in your diet in our modern world. But with calcium, because calcium is so strongly controlled in its absorption and utilization by vitamin D, most people eating a full diet that's loaded with micronutrients, as I've just shared an example of, they're actually going to have a normal and appropriate level of calcium in their body overall uh, by if they have a normal vitamin D. In other words, the, the vitamin D is going to make up for lower loads of calcium in the diet. There are a couple of uh, caveats to that, right? Um, some people may need to push more calcium in order to have optimal, um, uh, get the results they're looking for. So for example, calcium is, is very, very abundant in uh, both bone and muscle. So if you're taking care of somebody who is, say, recovering from an eating disorder and trying to put on a lot of lean uh, body mass, then dairy may be really helpful for them because it's going to really increase their calcium load. And when you look at things like vegetables, 
which are one of the main sources of calcium outside of uh, dairy, you have to eat really, really, really high quantities of vegetable matter, or you have to reach for something like a juice in order to get to those higher loads of calcium. With dairy, you know, one or two cups of dairy can really increase the amount of calcium that you're bringing in, which is why, you know, a lot of people who are trying to build mass and muscle mass uh, will reach for, for dairy and will drink a lot of milk. Uh, a lot of people, as I was saying, I mean, think about what, what milk is supposed to do. It's optimized for you to gain lean body mass. Uh, and that's what exactly what it's doing for the baby animals that are consuming it. It's also why if people are coming to me with a goal of weight loss, I may not be reaching for the uh, dairy because it can get in the way because of both the caloric load and the carbohydrate content and the fat content. And they may be better off reaching for something like a root vegetable uh, with some resistant starch, uh, particularly looking for more protein rich foods. You know, the day I, I, I included or, or just created to share with you today, it was 160 grams of protein, which is like 35 or 40% of calories from protein. Most people are, are as little as a third or a half of that. So 40 grams, 50 grams of protein is very typical for me to see. If Many that. people don't even reach 100. Yeah, exactly. And, and people do, I would say, overall much better when they go to those higher protein loads with very rare exceptions. Absolutely. So... Well, that's probably the biggest thing we see. And very rarely have we had anyone come into the coaching practice or the medical practice that's eating enough protein. Very rare. Absolutely. I mean, if we were working with bodybuilders or, or people like like bros and, and people like that, then sure. we might see that. But it's very, very rare. Sure. Absolutely. All right, Jim. I think that's enough for today. What do you think? I think that was great. Good job. Um, Thank you. So if you want to work with either of us, both of us, uh, check out the Fundamentals of Wellness. Uh, in the link below. Mm -hmm. There's also a link in Dr. Stillman's link tree. If you're interested in the medical side of things for the annual plans, don't forget about Dr. Stillman's HTMA uh, course at the end of the month. There's a link for that in his link tree as well. And we'll see you guys tomorrow. If you have any questions or anything that you'd like us to cover, drop them in the comments. The, uh, please leave it, uh, leave it in the comments. So have a great day and get outside. Thank you, James, for the reminder. Absolutely. Take care, everyone. Have a great day.